Yeah, how you doing? <laughs> All right, what's up? All right, we're here to do another video today, baby. We're here in the Upper East Side. Uh, yeah, I know it's been a little bit since my last video. I had a little bit of uh, back problems, you know, once you hit 24 years old, everything starts going to crap, you know? But uh, today we're coming to the Upper East Side. It's a giant swath of land here on the east side of the island of Manhattan, east of Central Park. I mean, there are multiple neighborhoods within it. I'm gonna tell you all that progress, all the change, all of the, you know, different distinctions or whatever, as much as I can, at least in 25 minutes. So don't, you know, don't freak out. Good Lord, I'm trying to, you know, I'm not teaching a college course here either. But at the same time, guys, you know, hang in there. It's gonna be a good one. There's a lot to cover here. You know, obviously you guys may recognize this neighborhood from, you know, TV shows like Gossip Girl, OMG, Totes, Fresh. You may recognize it from movies like, you know, Brecky at Tiff Tiffs. Huh? You know that movie, Eric? I have no idea what you're Breakfast talking. at Tiffany's? Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's what the cool kids call it. Uh, but there's a lot more to it, so we're gonna cover all that history. Also, Eric, that reminds me, how are you? Oh, good, thank you, Tom. Hey, no problem, man. I'm always concerned how you're doing. Uh, cool, well, also before we start, guys. Tom, uh, can I ask you something? What? How was your time on Flatbush Misdemeanor? Oh, it was great, man. Thank you. No, no big deal. Did a little roll on Flatbush like Misdemeanor. Movie star, yeah, yeah. You know, we, we, it took us 20 minutes to get here because everyone stopped to ask for autographs, uh, asked me to sign their, you know, hot dogs and stuff. So uh, check out the Patreon. That's where uh, that's where you guys support. That's where this thing grows. That's how I'm, you know, make a living off these things. That's how it's gonna grow, baby. Because let's be honest, Starbucks ain't endorsed me anytime soon. Also, guys, uh, you know, uh, like the video, subscribe if you've seen one of, more than one of these. That really helps. Bump the analytics, baby. Let's get bumped ahead of all those, you know podcasting fails or whatever the hell people are watching on YouTube, all right? So before we start, Eric, you ready to do this thing? I am ready to do Let's it. Let's get into the history, to the development, to everything about the Upper East Side. Yeah. All right, so we are in Carl Schurz Park uh, on the East River, very beautiful, very nice little views, and next to Gracie Mansion. Um, now. This is kind of going to talk to you about the first stage of development of Upper East Side. Now, obviously, it started out as Native American land outside of New York City for a very long time. It was Dutch farms and then, you know, British farms, all that stuff. It was, but it was mostly farmland. Uh, and this building was actually finished in 1799 by Archibald Gracie uh, and slaves, you know. Uh, but it actually was a wooden little, like, you know, a farmhouse uh, out in the country type, countryside. And that's kind of what the Upper East Side was for a very long time. Uh, it transitioned later on uh, into something else, but this is very typical of that time, and today this is actually where the mayor lives. So a little history about this building. Uh, after it was uh, built by Archibald Gracie, he ended up having to sell it. It went, it passed through lots of hands. It actually eventually became home to the Museum of City of New York. It actually was a concession stand for a little while. Uh, you can imagine buying airheads from this place. Uh, but today is where the mayor of New York lives. It was actually in 1942 that Robert Moses suggested to Fiorello LaGuardia that he move from, the, uh, from his house in East Harlem into this place as a mem as a, uh, uh, issue of national security. Uh, that's when you know your neighborhood's bad, when you know, you're being told to move out of there because of national security. But he moved in, and since then, all mayors have lived in this uh, house, except for actually uh, Mayor Bloomberg, because uh, I guess he's a billionaire, and he's like, I'm not living in this dump. I guess it's got to be pretty nice to have enough money where you know, a view of the East River uh, on a hill in the Upper East Side isn't nice enough for you. But this is uh, where the mayor lives today. Pretty cool, uh, actually a lot of history in that building as well. So Archibald Gracie was actually a socialite, very fancy guy, a lot of fancy friends, and, and um, Alexander Hamilton actually was a friend of his and would come here, and it was here that he actually courted his first investors for the New York Evening Post, which did it became today's New York Post. It started out as a Federalist newspaper uh, and then transitioned into, you know, a newspaper that makes headlines like, you know, hide the wiener, or, headless body in a topless bar. Very topical. Yeah. <laughs> you guys remember Anthony Weiner? Uh, all right. Well, uh, also, cool cool fact, uh, the, the, the fireplace in there used to belong to a man named Bayard who had a house over in what is today West Village, and that's where uh, Alexander Hamilton died. He died in front of the fireplace that's in this thing today. All right, so uh, this is kind of typical of what was, you know, here in the Upper East Side uh, before, you know. It was like, uh, it was all farmland and, and big properties and estates for centuries, actually, through the, the before when the Native Americans were here, then the, um, then the Dutch, the British, early Americans. Uh, so it, it, uh, it changed in the, the first quarter of the 1800s, and we're going to talk about that in our next spot. But before we do that, why don't we go inside, Eric? I'd love to go inside. 
Well, tough luck, because I don't have any of those connections, unfortunately. Uh, you know, I'm just a lowly YouTuber. They don't care about me. Um, but let's go to the next spot, how about that? All right, here we are at, uh, we're at the Frick Collection. This is a mansion that was built here in the early 1900s by Henry Clay Frick. But more importantly, we're, at the, we're in the uh, neighborhood known as Lenox Hill. We're on the western edge of it. So this is the southernmost neighborhood of the three neighborhoods that make up the Upper East Side, which are uh, Lenox Hill, Carnegie Hill, and uh, Yorkville. But this one is the southernmost, so it was the first one to be developed. In fact, it's named after a guy named Robert Lennox, who was a Scottish merchant who bought up some of this land from Archibald Gracie, who we just talked about. Look at that connecting, baby. Anyways, he bought it up, started developing it, speculating. Uh, speculators came in. Speculators mean they're trying to make monies. That's all that means. Uh, so it started to be developed 1820s, all around that time. Uh, by the way, we are on Fifth Avenue, which is what's called Millionaire's Row. This is where like tons and tons of mansions were built in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, mansions like this one. This was Henry Clay Frick's mansion. This is a steel guy, a uh, really famous uh, steel tycoon, uh, who actually, interesting fact, they tried to assassinate him. Uh, do you know this, Eric? In 1892, uh, this guy, Alexander Berkman, who was an anarchist, went into his office and shot him twice. Didn't die. That's the kind of thug a billionaire really is, huh? Anarchists always trying to kill the billionaires. Anarchists always trying to ruin the fun of all the rich people, huh? So that happened, but this, uh, this was actually built as his mansion uh, in the early 1900s, competing with his uh, rival slash friend, Andrew Carnegie, who has a mansion a little further north, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, so this is all Lenox Hill, and this was all developed uh, earliest, uh, then came Yorkville, and then came Carnegie Hill. Those are the three main neighborhoods within the Upper East Side. Uh, interesting fact, this is interesting. Did you know that uh, before Central Park, which is right across the street from us, was developed, they actually were considering a 132-acre plot over near the East River known as Jones Wood in Lenox Hill. Wow, wow. isn't that crazy? They're... That deserves an interesting fact graphic. That deserves a... No, epic fact alert, epic, epic fact oh, alert, oh, epic no, fact no, alert. No, yeah, fact. I know I had to take the strobe light off because I think people who are epileptic are gonna, you know, <laughs> go into shock watching that. But anyways, it's a pretty cool fact. Jones Wood was almost uh, Central Park, 132 acres over on the East River rather than the center, centerpiece we have now. Anyways, this is all Lenox Hill. Let's go to the next one of these neighborhoods and keep it moving, baby. What do you think, Eric? Let's go. Also, too, right around the corner is where Jeffrey Epstein lives. No. Totally unnecessary fact there. Unnecessary fact. Well, he, <laughs> unnecessary flat fact alert. <laughs> Don't worry, he's dead. He killed himself. All right, let's keep moving. So I'm on 2nd Avenue near 86th Street in what is considered Yorkville. Pretty much standing in the bike lane. Not, not the smartest place to be standing, but you know, why not? Anyways, this neighborhood uh, is kind of the traditionally uh, immigrant neighborhood of the Upper East Side. So starting in the mid 1800s, how are you doing? Starting in the mid 1800s, you started to have Irish and Germans start coming through. You can go through. Yeah, it's gonna be interesting. And they all started settling here. That's pretty cool. I don't know, I should be sitting on one of those. Anyways, you had the Irish and Germans start settling in this area, uh, but a couple things made it grow significantly. One of which was the elevated railway which came up here in the late 1870s and early 1880s on 3rd Avenue and 2nd Avenue. This started to bring an influx of people and started speculation in the area. People started buying up buildings, building apartments and stuff like that. More and more uh, Germans, Hungarians, Czechs started moving into the neighborhood. In fact, 86th Street at one point was known as Sauerkraut Boulevard, uh, which sounds like something that a racist would call it. It's like, oh great, I gotta go walk down Sauerkraut Boulevard. Uh, but that was actually what they nicknamed it. Uh, 79th Street was where the Hungarians were, and 72nd down there was where the, uh, the Czechs and the, uh, the Slovaks were located. Uh, in fact, they were very tied to the cigar industry. They had what were called cigar tenements, which were tenement apartments filled with people just making cigars. Uh, so, you know, if you ever want a cigar, you just gotta say, uh, check please, <laughs> you know? It's pretty good, right, Eric? Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Anyways, uh, this area, very German, but another thing caused it to become even more German in the early 1900s, and that was in 1904, the uh, General Slocum disaster, when a ship uh, carrying over uh, like 1,300 women and children, German women and children, from the uh, uh, East Village uh, actually sank in the East River and uh, it caused a huge uh, problem. A lot of people died, uh, over a thousand people died and a lot of people from the East Village moved up to this neighborhood to get away from the, uh, I guess, the memory of all of that. Yeah, it's pretty dark, sorry about that. 
I don't know what to tell you. Here's a picture of a dog or something. Uh, but this is the uh, this is today uh, also growing very quickly because of the subway that was just recently uh, put through Second Avenue. Uh, the Second Avenue line was recently finished 2017. We'll talk about that. Uh, but yeah, this is Yorkville. Pretty cool little immigrant neighborhood. Still has some old restaurants that you may have liked. You know, you get you're feeling. Uh, yeah, they're like how you doing? If you're feeling Hungarian yourself, you know, you can always go to like Ottoman Alley's is still here. You have uh, Scholler and Weber, which has been here since 1937. Heidelberg's 1939. You have all these restaurants and stuff that have been here for a very long time. So that's pretty cool. That, one, that guy almost killed me, I think. Uh, we're really, we're really pushing our luck here. But Yorkville still has a lot of uh, pride, a lot of uh, history from that, those, uh, those days. A lot of people don't even know this neighborhood exists, but yeah, still here, called Yorkville. And uh, all right, what do you think, Eric? Should we keep moving? Before we get run over by a bicycle and get killed, uh, let's go. Wait, wait. Oh, let's go. All right, so I'm here on Fifth Avenue and 90th Street at the Carnegie uh, Mansion, which is today the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum, to talk to you about Carnegie Hill. So Carnegie Hill stayed rural a little longer than the other two neighborhoods uh, because it was further north. It's from about 86th to 96th Street, from 5th Avenue over to around 3rd Avenue. Uh, and it was kind of the rich people. Uh, and it's called Carnegie Hill after this guy, Andrew Carnegie, who built this giant, massive uh, mansion in 1902. Uh, you know, he was kind of retiring. You know, he built it 64 rooms, <laughs> you know. Seems a little excessive, but I'm sure if you asked him, he'd say it's uh, one room for every one of uh, Mrs. Carnegie's moods. <laughs> uh, it was a total waste. But today, it's the Coupier Design Museum. You can go inside and, uh, you know, uh, see some cool design pieces and ex exhibits and stuff. Uh, but this is where the neighborhood Carnegie Hill got its name. This is one of the three neighborhoods, right? So you had Lenox Hill, which we just talked about, uh, and that was kind of the earliest neighborhood because it's the furthest south. Then you had Carnegie Hill come a little later, and Yorkville actually uh, preceding Carnegie Hill because of its uh, access to the Harlem Railroad and also uh, later the um, you know, the, the elevated railways as well. So these are three different neighborhoods that make up the Upper East Side, in addition to the parts that aren't covered in these neighborhoods. So it is a really giant area. It's really kind of what you need to realize about the Upper East Side. It's huge, and it's not a neighborhood in that regard. It's more of like this space, this giant part of uh, the island of Manhattan to the east of Central Park. Pretty crazy. Interestingly enough, Andrew Carnegie was one of Henry Clay Frick's associates and kind of, uh, you know, uh, our peers as well, and rivals, whatever you want to call them. Uh, so they both kind of, you know, try to top each other with their ma mansions here. I'm going to do a video on these mansions of Fifth Avenue one of these days, uh, so you hang in there. But uh, yeah, Carnegie Hill, the other, another one of the neighborhoods here. Wait, are we going to go inside? All right, let's go inside. Yeah. Seven Forty Park Avenue, one of the most storied apartment buildings in New York City. Now, before we talk about this building, number uh, building, uh, let's talk about Park Avenue. So, Park Avenue was actually laid out in the early 1900s. Now, all of the land north of Grand Central Terminal used to be open air tracks before the trains were electrified in early 1900s, when Grand Central Terminal, the beautiful Grand Central Terminal, was finished. Right? When they paved all this over in the early 1900s, when there was a huge building boom in New York. People started moving to this area. Tons of people started moving here. Rich people especially because, hey, it's the Upper East Side. All the mansions and everything nearby, they're like, I want to live there too. And around this time, apartments started becoming a thing for the rich with people like Rosario Candela designing buildings like this one. This was finished in 1929. He designed it. Apartments weren't really for the rich before, uh, but as you know, space became more of a premium and fancy people started designing them, they're like, ah, screw it, I'll move in. I'll get 20,000 square feet and I'll get to hang out. So for example, the triplex at the top was owned originally by John D. Rockefeller. Then, uh, then uh, now today it's owned by Steve Schwartzman, who bought bought it for 30 million in uh, in 2000, the year 2000. And now it's worth like 120 million. Pretty good investment. Maybe that's why he lives here to begin with. But it's also extremely exclusive in places like this. So this building, for example, they've turned down the co-op board. First of all, the co-op board requires you to have 100 million dollars in liquidity to move into this place. I Meaning you got to have 100 100 million dollars on hand in cash. Uh, which I guess makes sense because, I, I mean, I don't know, maybe you'll break a $50 million toilet, you got to be able to pay for it. Uh, and they're also very exclusive with who they let in. Neil Sadaka was turned down here, Barbara Streisand, 
Babs was turned down. I'm sure she sent the call board a message saying, you don't bring me flowers anymore. That was pretty good, right, Eric? Probably. Yeah. Anyways, it, you know, you have people like uh, who Vera Wang, the uh, David Koch, uh, you had uh, uh, Thomas Tisch, uh, Zeckendorf, one of the Zeckendorf uh, family. Like it's it's a lot of a lot of dough here, baby. J. Ezra Merkin, actually, one of the largest Rothko uh, collections uh, of paintings, had to sell them. You know, uh, when in 2008, after he was caught with uh, with being a middleman for Bernie Madoff. Uh, whoops! <laughs> Don't jump back on your face. Uh, and he would have gotten away with it too. It wasn't for you lousy regulations. So you never know. It's all kinds of things like this. But these are the kind of apartment buildings that started going up in the first quarter of the 1900s in this area on Park Avenue and the surrounding areas. Uh, and they started moving in. Kind of crazy. But that's what kind of Park Avenue. And also keep in mind, right nearby, you have Madison Avenue, which was laid out uh, in the 1800s by a man, helped by a man named Samuel Ruggles, who also helped lay out Lexington. Samuel Ruggles was developing uh, Gramercy Park area and he had an interest in, in you know connecting it a little more yeah his name was Ruggles but yeah so so these so you have here on Park Avenue people lived in the fancy apartments all that stuff and on Madison Avenue this is where they went shopping especially after like World War II in that area when consumption was high places like Barney's Dulce and Gabbana Hermes so you know you got a lot of stuff to, to kind of do around here uh, with, with, with uh, fanciness but um, yeah this very story building there's a book about it there's a uh, documentaries and all that stuff and is Jackie O's grandfather, actually, who, who uh, developed this building. And uh, she was actually one of her childhood homes, one of the places where she uh, used to hang out as a little kid. Uh, so kind of interesting, a lot of stories with the buildings on this street. But uh, yeah, this is Park Avenue. The apartments that started going up in the first quarter of the 1900s gave them more and more of a cachet and, and uh, you know, fanciness. But uh, yeah, what do you think, Eric? Should we keep moving? Yeah, let's go. I thought that was pretty concise to the point. Save some stories for when we get inside. I like it. Let's go. So I'm actually on the subway. This is the Q line going up the Second Avenue line. This has actually been in talk since 1920s when the IND was kind of being pitched around as the public transit option. Uh, it was put on the shelf in the 1970s when the city was in the can, and it was just recently finished uh, in 2017. Yeah, very seamless transition. Look at that. But the reason I bring this up is because this is one of the biggest developments in the Upper East Side recently. And because of this, you're able now to uh, start more speculation. There's been more building, more development in this neighborhood uh, because more people are able to access it. Before this, you had to take the, uh, the green line, the six, down, and it was a total nightmare. People were lined up outside. It was a total mess. So the subway, once again, has kind of... Uh, made this neighborhood, uh, you know, at least New Yorkville area, the east part of the Upper East Side, uh, more accessible and more uh, desirable. Go figure. And as you can see, it's very modern now. Uh, you know, it's kind of like Brave New World or something, except with probably more surveillance here. Uh, and it's also air conditioned because these are newer stations. Uh, and it's, so it's kind of nice. If you ever want to eat a cheap date or something, you come here and just have a kombucha or something on the platform. I don't know, if it's hot outside, I don't know. Anyways, uh, yeah, this is the Second Avenue line, the, the Q line. It's actually, it, this is the first phase of it. They actually intend to take it all the way up to 125th Street and also all the way down to Lower Manhattan. So it's supposed to basically traverse the entire east side of the island of Manhattan eventually. We'll see how long that takes. This took only almost 100 years, so, you know, no, uh, don't go get your hopes up. But this is kind of the latest development here in the Upper East Side and kind of what's, like I said, spurred some development. With that, what do, we, what do you think, Eric? Should we just keep moving? That was pretty adventurous. We went up the escalators. Oh, a little too adventurous. Yeah, some great uh, production value is what the what they call in the biz. So. All right, let's keep moving. <sighs> All right. Well, we've reached the end of our little journey through the Upper East Side. I'm right here in front of the Guggenheim. That's right, the Googie Googie High High. As you. Nothing? No. You don't like that? Well, some people call it that. No one calls it that. Anyways, uh, I'm here to finish up. You know, we're bookending the tour with some museums. A lot, like I said, a lot of the reason why there are so many museums in the area is because a lot of people whose collections they belong to, uh, you know, they lived around the area. In fact, Solomon Guggenheim ran it out of his plaza apartment uh, initially in the 1930s. And, uh, you know, this was built in 1959 by Frank Lloyd Wright. Ah, very and also, a little interesting fact, Frank Lloyd Wright lived at the plaza while he designed this and built it. 
you know, I digress. We'll cover this in a different video uh, with the museums, uh, but we made it through the Upper East Side. How about that? Huh? We learned a lot. Started out up here, isolated, far north, you know, farms, Native American land to farms by the Dutch, farms by the British, farms by the early Americans, and then it started to get developed in the early 1800s. And then you have these different neighborhoods that make up the bigger neighborhood of the Upper East Side that a lot of people don't really realize is the case. Uh, and then you have, you know, Park Avenue being paved over, the famous and rich and wealthy apartments that get built up in the area. Uh, you know, and you have it getting more and more connected to the city every day. Look at that. Huh? You tell a story there, Eric. What do you think of that? I think it's a good story. That's a pretty good story. But that being said, guys, thank you so much for watching. Hope you learned a little bit about the Upper East Side. Such a big, monstrous, you know, uh, nebulous area. Make some sense of it. Try to carve it into some kind of a narrative. Uh, if you enjoyed it, please, uh, you know, like, like it, you know, subscribe. Yeah, you know, also, too, please check out the Patreon, especially if you're one of the people who lives in this neighborhood, <laughs> you know. Uh, support, maybe make, make more of these things. I make a living, all that stuff, uh, produce more of these things, but uh, there's some extras on there, <laughs> okay. But, yeah, other than that, guys, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. Eric, what did you think, man? I thought it was great video time. Did you? I did. Ah. I thought the editing was especially good. Thanks. Thanks. It only took, like, eight days. But uh, yeah, we're here. I'm gonna, you know, Eric and me are gonna go uh, hang out. We're gonna go walk around the, look at some Kandinsky's or some Chagall's. Huh? More of a Rembrandt type myself. All right. Well, I guess we'll end up here. I'm gonna go uh, ice my shoulder and uh, keep it moving. All right. See y'all later. That's it.